As a radiation oncologist, um, you know, we do know we have failures, of course. We, need to, we know we cause toxicity. So a lot of what we do is trying to figure out ways to give more dose, which helps, you know, kill tumor, and obviously try to find ways to decrease toxicity. So this is kind of the alphabet soup. You know, we have IGRT, IMRT, SBRT, ART, MR Linux, protons, brachy combo, gel escalation, trimodality, focal boost, radial ligand therapy. We can confuse you easily. That's what a radiation oncologist does, but we have all these tools at our disposal, and really the odd of what we do is improving each and every day. So at IGRT, what are we doing? We realize the, tomb, the prostate moves. You know, it moves a lot, actually. A centimeter in any direction it damn well pleases, and now we need to figure out ways. If we're going to devise these radiation fields, we want to get the dose of the tumor. We want to do it safely so we can minimize toxicities everywhere else. So what we're doing with IGRT is we're putting fiducial markers in. A lot of you put those in for us. We're trying to align to that. And then we're giving daily radiation. But the way things are starting to migrate, we're doing cone beam CAT scans before our radiation treatment. We're making sure the rectum is empty because that can push up into the radiation field. Bladder folks, that can bring the bladder outside the radiation field. We have ways of looking into the body now. And we're starting to find ways of doing this real time as well. But IGRT has really become a standard of care in radiation as well as IMRT. What is IMRT? It's a fancy way of saying I want to give the tumor this much dose but I can only give the normal tissues that much dose. And you play that cost-benefit equation back and forth, but basically of what's called multi-leaf collimators, they open and close. When we're using VMAT therapy, as you say, so volumetric, we're spinning the machine around the patient in a 360-degree arc. Sometimes we do that twice, so 100, 720 fields of entry into the human body, each field being designed differently. Those MLCs are moving up and down continuously, we can render that treatment in 90 seconds. That helps us to account for the fact that if you're laying the table long enough, rectal gas is coming through, the bladder is filling, things are moving around. We really want to try to get that prostate in a state where it's not moving too much so that we can actually bring the dose that we, we that requires and obviously minimize all the dose around it because the normal tissues do suffer when they see radiation. SBRT, a lot of what Jason was talking about, you know, this is sort of we talk about the oral trial and everything else. We're using SABR, SBRT, but basically a fancy way of saying we're giving a lot of radiation quickly. So big doses per fraction, five treatments typically. Why five? That's what the government would pay for back in the day. Do we need eight? Maybe. It's three. Who knows? But it's five because of billing. Crazy, right? Just the way it is. But that's what most SBRT is. High doses of radiation, very precise, cyber knife, all the Linux can do it. But basically, when you're doing this, it becomes paramount to know where that tumor is, where that prostate is, because if it moves outside your field, you may be treating something you don't intend to treat, and you're not giving the dose of the, the prostate which is required. Where are we moving? Well, now we're starting to move to adaptive radiation therapy. What does this mean? We're using IMRT, we're using IGRT, so image guidance, VMAT, all of this, but now, on a daily basis, if it's worthwhile, we're looking, do things move out? Does the patient look different from our simulation? Do we have to revise that radiation field on the fly? Now, that little example on the bottom shows when we were planning, the rectum was behaving itself, was outside of where the radiation was gonna go, but we came to day one of treatment, well, had a little more gas in the rectum, a little bit of stool pushing into the radiation field, don't wanna treat that. So we can start to adopt, adapt these plans. So this is that personalized treatment, the precision medicine with technology of how we're treating. So how are we taking into the dynamics of the human body, which is you know, mobile, it moves. How do we kind of encompass for that so that we can now give what we want to give and minimize dose to other places? And there's publications coming out showing that we are probably decreasing toxicity, but it comes at a cost. Physician has to be at the machine. We have to recontour things. And this is where AI is helping radiation oncology as we stand. We talked about AI yesterday, but AI is really rapidly coming into the radiation oncology realms. It's helping us contour normal tissues. It's helping us contour the uh, organs at risk, even some of the tumor volumes. So we can do this quicker because adaptive planning, especially on MR Linux, as we talked about, what I'm going to talk about, could take an hour. We don't, can't spend one hour in every patient when this is one of the most ubiquitous cancers of, you know, a man's going to have. So how do we make those treatment times shorter and quicker? So talking about the MR Linac, this is something that we have in a hospital. We have MR simulators. You know, you can argue that we can now see motion. You can argue that the MRI is a little more uh, precise and not tumor delineation. 
but then we can provide real-time treatments on these MR Linux. But the problem is the throughput is problematic. If we can treat eight to 12 guys a day, that's a 12-hour day. Whereas on a current linear accelerator using CT technologies, we can treat 40 to 45 men. So it comes at a cost. We're using it sparingly. And you know, this is more used for GI malignancies, pancreatic stuff, things where things in the belly are moving around, lung tumors which are moving. But we are kind of playing around with prostate, especially in salvage treatments. Because to Isaac's point, sometimes we do have recurrences, so we're going to re-irradiate. And the benefit here is you can see the tumor move. You can see everything moving real time. So you can now dose modulate, bring the machine on, turn the beam on and off as necessary so it's not ex going past your fields of uh, execution. So you're going to get you know, pr more precise dosing. You really can looking to replan each and every day. And so you can see where the patient is at that point in time, change things as it's necessary to try to decrease your toxicity by meaning you're decreasing the dose you're giving to those organs at risk, bladder, rectum, and uh, things around that like the penile bulb. Proton therapy is something you hear about. There used to be two proton machines in the country, one at MGH and one at Loma Linda. Now there's plus 40 plus. Why? Because it's economically viable. And um, some insurances will pay quite a bit. A lot of patients will pay out of pocket. Um, do we use a lot of protons for prostate cancer? Not so much in Boston, but you go across this country, a lot of men are receiving protons for prostate cancer. The whole thought of protons is it has a brag peak, so it will stop. You can stop the energy. It's not a pass-through to kind of hit on the other side. For pediatrics, this makes a whole lot of sense, especially when you're doing cardiac spinal irradiation. If you're treating tumors near the optic nerve, chiasm, tumors in the spine, you do need to stop that radiation dose. Prostate, I don't know. You know, in the past, it was two lateral beams coming in, a rectal balloon pushing the rectum right up to the to to the the um, uh, into the radiation field. But now, as we're redoing machinery and MGH is redoing all their stuff as we speak, we have pens um, IMPT, so intensely modulated proton therapy pencil beams, as you can see in this picture. So we might be able to be more and more precise. But it's something you hear about, and you can talk to many people. You're not that many separations of somebody you know who probably received proton therapy. Now the jury's out whether the biology is any better, probably not. Can we decrease toxicities? Maybe. And I think that's something that's, you know, we're going to see pan out into the future. Prostate brachytherapy, something that's, you know, near and dear to my heart, but basically putting radiation isotopes into the prostate or, you know, high dose rate catheters, but basically a temporary 30 minute procedure, 40 minute procedure, the patient is done, no coming to and from, and I can actually dose paint my uh, radiation within the prostate. So I can give a whole lot of radiation dose, biologic effective doses more than I can achieve with beam. And if I'm just treating the prostate seminal vesicles and don't have to worry about the pelvis, well, then I can do everything very quickly, precisely, but you do have to pay attention to what you're doing in terms of toxicity. Now, a lot of brachytherapy can get a bad rap because it is operator dependent. If I treat the GU diaphragm, it's gonna cause a stricture. And you're gonna have to deal with it. And you don't like me when you have to do that. Rectal toxicities, they're low, but now with gels, you can obviate them. So if I, you know, I say the training wheel, so people starting out, put a spacer in you know, if you're really afraid of giving too much rectal dose. But now what you can do is basically give extra dose. So I can really light up that peripheral zone dominant nodules and give 200% of the dose. So my biological equivalent dose is through the roof. We're showing in the radiation external beam world with the flame trials, if we can give more dose to the dominant nodule, there's a higher probability of cure and actually not having those local recurrences that, you know, we, we know we have and we speak about. And a lot of it, too, with brachytherapy is you can avoid androgen deprivation therapy. There's a lot of good research coming out that says a duration of ADT for even the higher-risk men can be six months. For intermediate-risk men, can be three months, not two years or six months. ADT wrecks guys' lives. We know this. If you want to make an old, you know, a functionally robust old guy old, give him ADT. And just something that I don't personally like, and that's why I like brachy. Why? Because I can give more dose, higher probability of cure. And of course, we're talking about radial ligand therapies, uh, you know, plavicto, and this isn't really the ultimate in precision medicine. I mean, now it's a metastatic castrate, but you know, it will come, you know, further down the line. And basically, tagging to PSMA agents, bringing that lucium um, 177 right to where the cancer is. You know, we used to use strontium and samarium, but we would whack the bone marrow. That was, you know, didn't really work all that well. But this is more forgiving, and so we'll see how this plans out into the future. So that is the alphabet soup. And so what we want to do is we want to focus, really make sure we quality, have good quality. We want to minimize toxicities. That's a lot of what radiation is doing. Give more dose. We have a high probability of curing. 
And we have all these different techniques, all the advances in the uh, radiation equipment, spacers, really to be precision medicine and personalize the treatments so that patient in front of you with adaptive planning and the like. And of course, we have a lot of work to still do to make sure the technologies we bring forward actually have the benefit we think they will. And so I thought I will stop. <laughs>